Poland has a greater rail route mileage than reunited Germany and was once the steamiest country in Europe by far. It was a mecca for rail enthusiasts who had enough courage to brave the country's strict communist regime and the restrictions on photography that went with it. The concept of railway interest, like in most communist countries, was simply not understood. And anyone pointing a camera at a railway facility was as likely as not to be a spy. Enthusiasts from Britain were allowed in under strict controlled conditions. Polish guides had occasion to reprimand groups for photographing something illegal, like a shed or a station building. By the time those tensions and restrictions had all but vanished, there were still a few pockets of working steam, such as this TKT-282 tank working out of the market town of Klodzko, near the Czech border. These engines were introduced in 1950 and were once widespread throughout Poland. Their initial design had to be modified to overcome poor steaming and, it is said, to correct the unwillingness to remain on the rails. Nevertheless, the end result was a functional, if not exactly aesthetic machine, which became Poland's standard general purpose tank engine. The ubiquitous Kriegslok survives in small numbers, particularly in western Poland on secondary passenger duties. Here, one of the 1,900 Kriegs, which ended up in Poland after the war, heads a very typical and mainly empty local passenger service. The classification TY2 is applied to Polish Kriegs. The classic ex-Prussian railways P8460 was introduced in 1906 as a superheated general passenger engine. Known as class OK1, this sole survivor enjoys active preservation, including occasional forays on scheduled passenger trains. P8 is the last in a long line of ex-Prussian railways classes that have featured as part of Polish state railways fleet over the years.
The now classic steam depot at Waltz Inn is now semi-preserved, although it does still field a few locos for the odd local passenger. Here, another Kriegs lock is prepared for duty. Classified TY3, this is a Polish-built locomotive. The mighty PT-47 282s were impressive modern express engines and the last mainline express type to be produced in Europe. 180 were built altogether and in the 60s and early 70s handled a high proportion of Poland's heavy expresses outside electrified territory. Some examples, including survivor number 112 based at Klodzko, have mechanical stokers. Working steam on the Polish mainline is unlikely to see regular use, except in isolated instances or by special arrangement. Although several depots have one or two steam engines available for heritage purposes, which may occasionally be turned out to cover shortages. But the difficulties facing the country's attempt at conversion to a Western-style economy are more likely to bring about line closures and traffic losses than replacement by diesels. Either way, it's bad news for steam. Regular Turkish steam lingered on until the early 80s. Kars is a border town in the northeast and is the starting point for a 1993 special train to Adana on the Mediterranean coast, using a variety of Turkish steam power. As will be seen, Turkish steam locos tend to follow German practice and design. Kurdish rebels are active near the Armenian border and the party of German and British enthusiasts on board are accompanied both on train and on neighbouring roads by armed soldiers. Our locomotive, number 56140, is one of the standard Turkish 210s introduced in 1937 by Henschel. Further examples followed from various builders including Bayer Peacock and Vulcan Foundry. Thought by many to represent the epitome of German steam design, it has been suggested that these engines are finer than anything which saw service in Germany. Number 56140 is from the Czech builder CKD, appearing in 1949. Her consist is an authentic reproduction of a mixed train, very typical of the last days of steam in Turkey. Over this heavily graded route, number 56140 is assisted by another of the same class, number 56052, a crop product of 1940, which has been exceptionally well turned out. Definitely not typical of Turkey's final steam workings. Today those engines which survive are for strategic, emergency and excursion use.
prospect of working steam through spectacular scenery under sunny skies drew many British enthusiasts to Turkish tracksides and occasionally to Turkish jails in the 70s and early 80s. Today, stage-managed rail tours like this one provide a less authentic but safer way to enjoy what Turkey has to offer. With the pilot engine now detached, 56140 continues her way, following the Euphrates River towards Sivas. Dumped at Sivas is this Stania 8F280, one of several supplied to the Middle East during the war. Turkish railwaymen call them Churchills. Also dumped at Sivas is one of few survivors of the 88 Skyliner 210Os, supplied by Vulcan Ironworks of Wilts Bar, Pennsylvania between 1947 and 1949. This is number 56513, one of 53 Kriegslok 210s supplied to Turkey. She was originally Deutsche Reichsbahn number 52316 and came to Turkey in 1943, supposedly on hire. She's a Borsig product. Other Kriegs that ended their days here originated from builders MBA, Schwarzkopf and Floristdorf. The supply of Kriegs to Turkey was part of German efforts to persuade Turkey to join the war on the side of the Axis powers. Perhaps a not dissimilar intention was behind the supply of Stanier 8Fs from the UK, although to keep Allied supply lines open was probably the real motive. The Kriegs, just like in so many other countries, proved themselves rugged, simple and reliable machines on all types of traffic. They even took charge of the Istanbul portion of the erstwhile Orient Express on occasions. The prospect of steam traction through scenery like this is why Turkish steam tours sell so well, and one can only hope economics and world politics will allow their operation to continue. This is Henschel 282, number 46052, one of 11 of the only modern express passenger steam class built for Turkey, where, generally speaking, 10 coupled mixed traffic engines have always been more useful. Parts from this class were interchangeable with the big standard 210s seen earlier. Here, number 46052 is paired with a bare peacock tender from a 210 and is making heavy weather of a fairly light train.
The historic city of Brasov, 100 kilometers north of Bucharest, is the starting point for this steam special to Kvasna. Four six zero number two three zero two two four is a Romanian-built version of the famous Prussian Railways P eight class. This highly successful mixed traffic type totaled over three thousand eight hundred, and the Romanians themselves adopted the design and built many more. The capside plates carried on all Romanian locos indicate running number, last major repairs, maximum speed, home depot, and rather unnecessarily the owner. Here, typical of the current Romanian steam scene, are these dumped class 50 210s, a German design adopted by the Romanians and built in large numbers. After the breakup of the Prussian system, P8s found themselves working in Czechoslovakia, Germany, Poland, Yugoslavia, Greece and the Baltic states, as well as in Romania. An innovative feature of the Romanian locos is the ability to burn oil from supplementary tanks in the tender. This was used when the loco was working hard to supplement the normal diet of coal. Out of Kavasna into the foothills of the Carpathian Mountains leads one of several 760 mm gauge lines which serve the Romanian forestry industry. Nearly all the forestry lines rely exclusively on 080 tank engines from various builders in Germany, Romania and Hungary and are known collectively as Class 764. These narrow gauge lines still provide an important transportation service to the industry as roads in the forested areas are poor or non-existent. This line relies on a rope-worked incline to link the forests with an associated sawmill. Both raw timber and the finished product are transported on narrow-gauge wagons up and down the incline. Shunting at the foot of the incline is carried out by horsepower. Another forestry line runs into the mountains from Taslau. These attractive lines have only been discovered by steam enthusiasts since the easing of east-west tensions, and it's easy to see why they have become so popular with both photographers and train riders. A 
Again, the Taslow line uses the standard class 764 tank as motive power. The burning of wood is commonplace on forestry lines, for obvious reasons. This also accounts for the very necessary spark arresters fitted to the chimneys of all locomotives. Back on the standard gauge, 230098 is another P8, heading a short special to Moldavita. As 230098 is sounding distinctly unhealthy, it's perhaps fortunate that this special train has only two vehicles. At Moldavita, another 760mm gauge line serves the local forestry industry. The loco here is a class 763 number 193, a Kraus 060 tank of 1921, and a change from the more usual 080 tanks.
the vehicle behind the loco serves a dual purpose. Accommodation for the crew and a bunker for extra fuel, as the engine can't carry enough for the whole journey. This means stops must sometimes be made to transfer fuel into the engine cab. The timber industry in Romania is currently suffering from low demand and many lines, including this one, only run once or twice per week. Hard work is the order of the day and thankfully for our camera crew, dramatic smoke effects are not prevented by spark arresters. The Viso de Sus line is regarded as the most scenic of all the Romanian forestry lines, as well as one of the busiest, if one train a day can be regarded as busy. This system has a network of lines from the surrounding forests, serving the local timber plant. Locomotives here are the standard class 764-080 tanks. As well as serving local industry, this network provides a local transport service, both officially for passengers and unofficially for somebody's shopping. The working day starts early as the locos, usually just one or two, are prepared at the loco shed at Viso de Sus. The sun slowly penetrates the early morning mist as wagons are marshalled for the day's traffic requirements.
the first train of the day stops for local passengers. The host pipe, draped across the front of the locomotive, is used to dip into lakes or mountain streams for boiler refreshment when necessary. Here again, train crew and locomotive fuel shares a vehicle behind the engine. This time it seems to be a garden shed adapted for the purpose. Here too, the loco must work hard to lift the empty wagons into the mountains. Most lines were built so that gravity would assist the movement of loaded wagons down to the sawmill or railhead. Shunting with chains to bridge the gap between two tracks is commonplace. The Romanians are nothing if not inventive, as evidenced by adaption of this lorry to rail use. The future of the Romanian forestry industry is uncertain, suffering at the moment from both lack of demand and exhaustion. But as long as there is a need for rail transport, then it is likely that steam will survive here, as sufficiently powerful 716mm gauge diesels are hard to come by. But the real threat is surely the overwhelming problems facing countries such as Romania who are only now turning to Western-style economies. And it remains to be seen whether or not the steam railways and indeed the industry as a whole will survive the traumas involved. Despite the sheer vastness of the former Soviet Union, a small number of locomotive types built in huge numbers provided motive power for the enormous and busy rail system. And it's only since the easing of east-west tensions that visitors from the west have been permitted to set eyes on Russian steam engines, never mind photograph or ride behind them.
In the absence of a modern highway network, the Russian rail system still provides the only practical form of transport, both for passengers and for the vast majority of freight. But a BR-style modernization program in the early 50s consigned most steam locos to strategic reserve sidings, steamed very occasionally to keep them in working order. But despite the reliance on railways for freight traffic and a reported shortage of motive power, scrapping of the huge strategic reserve has now begun in earnest. Nevertheless, some examples have been retained, so far for excursion use, enabling us to show you examples of the main types in action. The world's most numerous steam class, the Class E 0 standard freight engine. An estimated 12 to 15,000 examples were built altogether, including numerous subclasses. This single class was therefore more numerous than BR's entire steam fleet in 1960. Some engines, including this example of subclass ER, were built in Poland and others in Hungary. A development of the Class E was the SO17 Class 210 freight loco, introduced in 1934, of which over 5,000 examples were built, some not appearing till after the Second World War. The class featured a very necessary light axle load, and over a thousand of these engines had condensing tenders for use in areas where water supplies were scarce. If the Class E was Russia's standard freight engine, the Class SU-262 was the standard design for passenger work, handling the majority of steam-hauled passenger trains in Russia. 3,750 were built altogether and could be found throughout the Soviet Union in their heyday.
The Class L 210 was a handsome heavy freight design which took full advantage of the very generous loading gauge. Over 5,000 appeared in the nine years immediately after the war. It was the first Soviet design to feature box box driving wheels. These awesome, hauntingly beautiful 484s first appeared as Project 36 in 1950 and were intended to revitalise long-distance heavy passenger trains which had become neglected after the war. Only 250 were built, a small number in Russian terms. Their career was cut short in 1955 when the modernisation programme was announced. Fortunately, several P-36 survive, both as working engines and static displays. This P-36 number 71 is part owned by a British group and there are long-term plans to preserve it in the UK at Peterborough. Can you imagine British Rail having divested itself of mainline steam traction running virtually all trains, freight and passenger on the Cambrian or Kyle of Lochalsh lines behind steam locomotives purely to keep steam railways from becoming just a memory? That's what has happened in South Africa. Once a target for steam enthusiasts from around the globe, thanks to a large number of engines in service and almost guaranteed sunshine. But steam on South African mainlines officially ended in March 1992 and steam operation was overtaken by the Transnet Museum, a national body charged with the continued operation of steam locomotives, including hiring to the national network when necessary. The George Neisner branch, skirting the southern tip of the African continent through the highly scenic Wilderness District, is still largely, but not quite entirely, steam worked. 
Its two or three times daily mixed trains in each direction serve to remind the South African public at large of their considerable steam heritage. Trains are usually worked by Class 24 284s, of which 100 were supplied by the North British Locomotive Company in Glasgow. Class 24, number 3632, has been a regular performer on this route for several years and is kept in excellent external condition by her crew. The whole stretch of this magnificent coastline is known as the Garden Route and, not surprisingly, is a favourite holiday destination for South Africans. The 24s were designed to work over branch lines laid with light rail, which often ruled out heavier 19C and 19D classes with their greater axle loadings. On these lines, elderly 6th and 7th class engines soldiered on until the class 24s arrived from Scotland. The river bridge at Kymans is surely one of the most photographed railway structures in the world, and it's easy to see why. But the Class 24s don't have the place to themselves. Here, two Class 19D 482s head the Union Limited special train towards Neisner. The 19Ds were the most common branch line engines in South Africa, first emerging from Krupp in Germany in 1937. Later batches came from Borsik, Skoda, Robert Stevenson and North British. 
235 were built altogether, surviving intact until serious dieselisation began in the late 70s. Union Limited is South Africa's answer to the long-distance luxury touring train, offering various itineraries around the country with much steam haulage. The two 19Ds take things carefully over the combined road and rail bridge over the Taos River. Although the appearance of the special train is a welcome extra movement, it is the Class 24 on the daily mixed which will always be associated with the George to Neisner branch line. The gradients are quite testing, particularly between Wilderness and George. When freight traffic is heavy, it is sometimes necessary to double head the train. Observation suggests that staple freight traffic is freshly cut timber and steel pipes, although in practice a variety of traffics were observed. Some diesel working is creeping in, although the attraction of steam haulage is seen as important to the local tourism-based economy. Botswana was once host to a 400-mile stretch of Cecil Rhodes Cape to Cairo Railway, which was operated for many years by neighbouring Rhodesian railways. The line still exists, but is diesel worked in its entirety. Workaday steam does, however, live on, notable at BCL Limited's Salibi Piqui copper mine, which both produces and processes copper and nickel ore. The mine is home to a fleet of nine second-hand 19th class 482s from Rhodesian and South African railways. Some have been cannibalised to keep the rest of the fleet running. This is number three, formerly Rhodesian Railways number 319, a Henschel built engine of 1952. Number seven is former South African Railways number 3341, built in Glasgow by the North British in 1948. Steam is in use seven days a week here, with three locos needed on weekdays and two at weekends. As recently as June 1992, BCL were placing adverts in South African Sunday newspapers for a locomotive foreman with experience of 19th class engines. So the future of steam seems assured. Although in the world of industrial steam, nothing is certain. In Africa, industrial railways rely on mainline cast-offs to meet their needs. 
and the Salibi Pikui copper mine is just one location in Africa where former mainline engines have found new careers. In some cases, the new life lasting longer than the original stint of mainline duty. But elsewhere, diesels have made considerable inroads in industrial railways, in some cases to the point of steam's extinction. Zimbabwe was considered until quite recently to have a very bright future indeed for a fleet of large Bear Garrett articulated locomotives, with many engines receiving what amounted to virtual rebuilds. This was rightly thought to be a cheaper and more practical way of meeting the emerging nation's transport needs than brand new, high-tech, oil-thirsty diesels. But Western aid translates into new General Motors locomotives and steam died, at least officially, in 1993. The Zimbabwe National Railway Museum, located in Bulawayo, puts many of the locomotives in its care through the works to keep them serviceable. This is 7th class 480 number 43. Number 115 is another museum loco and also from North British a class 9B built in 1917. But the real thing's not quite dead yet. 20 or 30 bare garrets are usually in steam each day in Bulawayo to handle local freight and switching assignments. This 15A class monster was built by Bear Peacock's Gorton Works in Manchester in 1950. We'll take a steam haul trip from Bulawayo's 1914 built station to Victoria Falls, following in the footsteps of the famous overnight mail train. Number 402 is another 15A class Garrett. British ruled parts of Africa were particularly loyal to the Garrett design, which was developed in an effort to maximise power available on lines of light axle loading, avoiding the need for double heading. The Garrett locomotive was a common sight throughout the continent. Although originally intended for lines with heavy gradients, they can also cope well with flat sections, maintaining reasonable speeds for long periods.
Zimbabwe has entered the luxury train business in a big way, with rail safaris excursions providing the successful and appealing combination of steam, luxury accommodation, constantly changing scenery and the chance of seeing some wild animals. But unlike Great Britain's Royal Scotsman or Europe's Orient Express, in Zimbabwe, steam traction is seen as an essential part of the operation. Thompson Junction is the interchange point with the Wanky Colliery Railway. This is an extensive steamwork system using second-hand locos from both Rhodesian and South African sources. Garrett No. 415 is another 15A class. This example was built by Société Franco-Belge in 1952. North of Thompson Junction, the line twists through the bush as it gains height, allowing the other side of the Garrett's performance to manifest itself. The steady uphill route is tackled with gusto as the twin unit locomotive maximises its power output. It's a bit late now, but it would have been interesting to see what bare Garrett engines would have made of lightly laid colliery branches in England or the steep and sinuous West Highland line in Western Scotland. The Zambezi Express coaches were built between 1920 and 1950 by Metropolitan Camel and Cravens in England and also by Rhodesian Railways' own workshops in Bulawayo. Arrival at Victoria Falls so named in honour of Queen Victoria by explorer David Livingstone in 1855. We're 470 kilometres from Bulawayo. It was one of Cecil Rhodes' dreams that passengers on his Cape to Cairo railway should be able to feel spray from the mighty falls as the train crossed high over the Zambezi. We'll return to see if this wish is fulfilled later in the programme. In the meantime, number 402 works the Zambezi special back to Bulawayo.
This is the West Nicholson branch, southeast of Bulawayo. We're at Colleen Bourne for an early morning run to West Nicholson. The engine today is number 601, a 16A class Garrett. She was originally built as number 625 by Bear Peacocks in 1953. For part of the return journey from West Nicholson, number 601 is teamed up with 14A number 525 for a short section of double-headed working. The 14As were also from Bear Peacock in the 50s. Number 525 bearing works number 7604 was the last of the batch to be built. The wagons marshal between the two locos are to spread the weight of the combined engines over the line's bridges.
Class 20A 482284 Garrett number 730, the ultimate Garrett design for Rhodesian Railways. Yet again, she's a bare peacock being exported from Manchester in 1958, three years after Rhodesian Railways took delivery of their first English electric mainline diesel. Number 730 is working the train from Bulawayo to Plumtree, close to the border with Botswana. After refreshment for both passengers and locomotive, the huge Garrett heads back to Bulawayo. back at Victoria Falls, and in a bold new initiative, Zambian Railway's 12th class 482 is going to work over the famous bridge and on into Zambia. Number 204 was built at Queen's Park Works Glasgow by North British in 1928. She's one of an original class of 20 engines. She's originally a Rhodesian Railways loco, being handed over to Zambia in 1967. She was restored to working order in Zimbabwe Railways Zeko Works. This is one of the first steam haul passenger trains to cross the bridge since the 1970s. The train makes the obligatory photographic stop on the bridge before the ill-fated adventure begins. The train heads on into Zambia, past derelict locomotives dumped near to the border town of Livingstone. In Livingstone itself, number 204 pauses for train passengers to be greeted by Zambian railway and government officials. We find them creeping around our coaches taking notes. You can take notes, don't pinch anything. <laughs> But formal niceties don't run steam trains. Steam locomotives, just like humans, need abundant supplies of water. And thanks to the recent severe drought, this well can only supply half the required amount. Nevertheless, half a tankful is, in theory at least, better than nothing, and hopes are high as number 204 steams on. 
the railway infrastructure showing signs of recent expenditure on bridge improvements. Half a tank full may be better than nothing, but it's not enough to get 204 to the next supply point, and it was obviously not considered necessary to carry standby supplies of additional tank wagons. The train is over 100 kilometres from the nearest civilization, and as passengers settle down to await rescue, the crew drop the fire. Milepost 96 and a half is to become home for the next 15 and a half hours until rescue eventually arrives. A bold adventure to bring the tourists back to Zambia had gone sadly wrong. Dealing with the needs of the locomotive must be given equal priority with those of the passengers if it's to succeed the next time. <laughs>